My king was born king. The Bible says he's a seven-way king. He's a king of the Jews. That's a racial king. He's a king of Israel. That's a national king. He's a king of righteousness. He's a king of the ages. He's a king of heaven. He's a king of glory. He's a king of kings. And he is the Lord of lords. Now that's my king. Do you know him? He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. And he's impartially merciful. That's my king. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He heals the sick. He forgives sinners. His life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. Well, I wish I could describe him to you. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. The heavens of heaven cannot contain him, let alone a man explaining him. Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. The witnesses couldn't get their testimony to agree. And Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him, and the grave couldn't hold him. That's my right. I don't know about you, but I am fired up. <laughs> I got fired up the first time that I saw a clip from That's My King, and I get fired up every single time that I see that clip or I hear parts of that message by S.M. Lockridge. You know, I couldn't think of a better way to begin the last message of our series on Jesus than watching that and being reminded that Jesus is our King. Two weeks ago, we began this journey where we've been taking a look at the most important question that there is ever. This is the most important question, and it's a question every single one of us is confronted with, and we all have to come up with our own answer to this question. And in fact, we do better to answer this question in this lifetime than waiting until it's too late. And that question, of course, is, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus is the most important question that we can ask, and we need to answer correctly. In fact, this question was asked by Jesus himself to his disciples nearly 2,000 years ago. We find this question being asked in the New Testament book of Matthew. That's the first of the four Gospels in Matthew chapter 16. It says in verse 15, he said to them, but who do you say I am? And this question is an individual question. He was asking the group of the disciples, but they each had to have their own answer to this question. And one of the disciples, Simon Peter, he says this. He says, you are the Christ the Son of the living God. Now, if you rewind just a little bit about 30 years before that point, when Jesus was born, an angel appeared to some shepherds and listened to the announcement of Jesus' birth to this group of shepherds. The angel says, Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. So we've been using the angel's birth announcement as, as a guide for this series and looking at who Jesus is. Two weeks ago, we started the series off and we looked at Jesus, the Messiah. And, and we talked about the fact that Jesus is the anointed one sent by God to save the people. Jesus is the Messiah who saves everyone in this world. Now, last week, we took a look at Jesus, a Savior. And more than just a Savior, Jesus is the Savior. He is the one who came 
because each and every one of us, we are fallen. We are fallen sinners, and we sin because we're sinners. And because of that, we're separated from God. We're spiritually dead. We're separated from God now, but we will be separated from God for eternity because of our sin. But Jesus, our Savior, he came. He died on the cross. He paid the penalty, the penalty that you and I owe. He paid it himself willingly with his own life. And his death on the cross satisfied God's punishment against you and I because of our sins. That's what it means that he is our Savior. We're taking a look at Jesus the Lord on this Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is the day that Jesus triumphantly entered into Jerusalem just days before he was crucified and died for our sins. And as we begin, I want to look at understanding this term and the significance of the word Lord. Now, in ancient Rome, uh, the, the rulers like Julius Caesar, they were absolute rulers. And during Jesus' time, the, the, it was Augustus Caesar. The emperor of Rome was already the most powerful, the most influential man on the earth at that time. And, but that wasn't enough for Augustus Caesar. He wanted to be seen as the supreme spiritual leader. He wanted to be seen as a god. And in fact, one year on the fortuitous uh, appearance of Halley's Comet, he used that to tell people that that was the spirit of Julius Caesar going on into the heavens and that he, as Julius Caesar's heir, was himself a god because he wanted absolute power. Because with absolute power, people would worship the Roman emperors. And, and it, it was because of that, the Roman emperors were referred to as Lord. People would bow down to them. They would worship them as the absolute rulers. So during the, that time, uh, if you wanted to call anyone besides Caesar Lord, then that was a serious offense. In fact, that was an offense that was punishable by death. It was considered a rebellious act. Because if Caesar is Lord, then that means no one else can be Lord. But if Jesus is Lord, then Caesar cannot be Lord. In fact, Jesus was crucified, and when he was crucified, the Romans put a sign up on the cross above his head, and it said uh, that he's the king of the Jews. Now, the Romans recognized that there were other kings, but the emperor, he was Lord. He was the supreme, powerful, all-powerful one at that time. So they were actually saying that Jesus wasn't Lord, but it was Caesar that was Lord, but Jesus was just a king. In fact, for early Christians to recognize that Jesus is Lord, that was a life-threatening statement. Why do you think so many Christians were willing to be burned alive or crucified or fed to wild animals? Well, it was because they didn't have a half-hearted allegiance to Jesus, their Lord. They had a fully devoted allegiance to Jesus. He was their Lord, and they were willing to put their life on the line to recognize the fact that Jesus alone is Lord, not Caesar. So what does that mean for us today in 2021? What does it mean for us to say that Jesus is Lord? Well, the Greek word for Lord is the word curious. Now, this word curious, it's used about 740 times in the New Testament, and the vast majority of the times that it's used, it's referring directly to Jesus. And that word, Lord, or curious, it means master and one with absolute control. This is why Caesar wanted to be Lord. In fact, it's important to, to understand that when we use that term as Jesus as Lord, that's defining the relationship between those who follow Jesus and Jesus. And we're saying that Jesus is our master. Jesus is our absolute ruler, the one who has control of our lives. So for Christians, when they say that Jesus is Lord, it means he's in control. He's master. Now, also what was being said here, Lord means that Jesus is God. You see, the Apostle Paul and, and early Jewish Christians at this time, that title Lord or curious was a title that they were familiar with. It was one that they used to ascribe to the one true God of Israel. Now, we, we see this first in, in Deuteronomy 6.4. Uh, this is the, the beginning of a, of a popular passage known as the Shema. And it starts with, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Well, that word Lord right there, 
uh, God's people at that time, they wouldn't even speak the name of Yahweh out loud. They would say Adonai. They would use that word for God. Well, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, uh, they used the word kurios there for God. So the Lord, Adonai, kurios, our God, the Lord is one. So the New Testament was written in Greek from the beginning. It didn't have to be translated from Hebrew, Hebrew into Greek. It was written in Greek. And, and when the, there was a time where a scribe was asking Jesus a question about what's the greatest commandment. Jesus' answer, he goes right back to that passage in Deuteronomy 6.4. And Jesus answered and says, the most important is this, hear, O Israel, the Lord, Kyrios, our God, the Lord is one. So we, we see that term being used again. Now, w- with full knowledge of this and knowing that Curios was the name of God, the Apostle Paul, when he wrote uh, 1 Corinthians 8, 6, he says that about Jesus. Well, listen to this. Yet for us, there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist. And one Lord, Curios, Jesus Christ, through whom we are are all things and through whom we exist. So again, that that same term, curios, is being used for Jesus here by the Apostle Paul with full knowledge that that is the name that they use for God. So this term, Lord, means Jesus is God. It's sort of like in week one of this series when we looked at the fact that that the word, the Hebrew word for Messiah is the same thing as the Greek word for Christ. It's the same thing. So Adonai and Kyrios both mean Lord, and they mean that Jesus is our master, the one in control. The final thing to understand about this term Lord is that Jesus as Lord means that I give control of my whole life over to him. You see, Jesus as Lord, he he demands to be the ultimate leader of our life, to be the one who leads above all other voices, above all other influencers. And because Jesus is Lord, then he has the right to control every area of my life. What are we talking about in every area? Well, our character, our relationships, our decisions, our finances. There's not an area of life that Jesus does not demand to be Lord over. You see, we don't get to pick and choose that, well, I want Jesus to be Lord over these few, but then I want to keep these ones for myself. If Jesus is Lord, then Jesus is Lord of all. In fact, in the New Testament, it's very clear that Jesus is Lord of all, and I want to show you several verses here that that say that. Starting with Acts 10.36, this is the message of the good news for the people of Israel, that there is peace with God through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. There you see it right there. It's very clear. Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. But if we go a little further, Matthew 28.18, and then Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Now, we usually focus on the rest of that passage, but just right there, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus. He's Lord of all. Ephesians 1.22 says, and he put all things under his feet, and he gave him his head over all things to the church. Again, we focus on the fact that Jesus is the head of the church, which he absolutely is, but just a few words before there, and he put all things under his feet. So again, Jesus is Lord of all. Romans 11.36 says, For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. And then Colossians 2, 6 through 10, For in him, this is talking about Jesus, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. So Jesus is Lord of all. Jesus is Lord of all. Now, last week, we looked at this diagram here that I want to show you again. And we we talked about the, uh, the spiritual growth process, and we connected it to some theological terms related to salvation. We focused mostly last week on the the change that happens between the natural man and the new life. Well, this week, as we talk about Jesus being Lord, we want to talk about the changes that occur from the time that we become a follower of Jesus, but then they continue on the rest of our life on this planet. So since Jesus is Lord of all, he is master. He's one with absolute control. It's important to realize this. 
that following Jesus costs everything. Following Jesus, it costs me everything. In fact, in the New Testament book of Luke, in chapter 14, Jesus is talking about the cost of discipleship. And listen to his words in Luke 14, 26. He says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. He then goes on for verses 27 through 32, and he, he, he's talking about counting the cost, and he uses an illustration of building a tower and kings uh, preparing to wage war. And then he wraps things up, verse 33, with this. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. You see, following Jesus costs me everything. And when Jesus says that we need to hate our father and mother and wife and children and brother and sister and even ourself, he's making a comparative statement. Jesus' primary message is the message of love. He, he says, a new command I give you, love one another. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. And he says that he showed us what love is by sacrificing himself for us. So Jesus isn't making a contradiction here. He's making a comparative statement. He's saying that the love that we have for him as our Lord should so far surpass the love that we have for any one of these human relationships, which we dearly love, that it looks comparatively like we hate them because of how much more we love Jesus. So I love my wife this much. I should love Jesus this much. It, 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 it's, he's making a comparative statement. So I want you to listen to the words of Mark Clark, he's a pastor and an author, and I, I like the way he puts it. He says, Jesus changes our minds, souls, and bodies from what we used to value and celebrate and take joy and pleasure in to something else entirely. People who give their lives to Jesus become different people if they follow Jesus where he takes them. We cannot simply add Jesus into our existing lives. We must reorient everything around him. So Jesus is Lord of all, and, and it's when we reorient our lives completely around him that we make him our Lord. Here's another diagram I want you to look at. This is typically how we think about and, and, and divide up the different slices of our life. This is like a pie where you can see that we're there in the middle as the ruler, master of our own lives, and we have a, a slice for these all these different things in life, families of slice, our career, church, school, the community, money, etc. There's Life is just divided up even to slices. Now, we even have a, a Jesus slice. We have this slice that we, that we let Jesus into, and, and, and maybe he can have some influence there. But followers of Jesus, those who reorient their lives around him, they take themselves out of the middle, and Jesus is no longer just a slice of the pie. He's there in the middle of the pie. He's the main ingredient of a pie. If, in fact, if this were an apple pie, Jesus would be the apple. You, you, you can't have apple pie without apple. That's the main ingredient. Yeah, there's sugar and flour and some other things, but apple's the main ingredient. So here, Jesus is the main ingredient because he is Lord of all. We, we consider him in all of the things that we do. Well, let's take a, a deeper look at that. What does it mean practically? What does it mean practically in everyday life? Well, I want to show you five practical ways that we can put Jesus in the center of our life. So first, this means that I seek his direction for every decision in my life. Decisions about everything, about relationships, who to, who to date, who to marry, who, who to have friends with, how, how do I relate to my kids and my extended family? My finances, buying a, a, a house or a car or making other purchases, maybe making investments, whatever it is. Jesus is a part of my financial decisions. And then my career, my, my job, what, what type of job am I going to have? Where am I going to work? What kind of work am I going to do? He's a part of that. And vacation, uh, where am I going to go on vacation? When am I going to go on vacation? How much money am I going to spend on vacation? I mean, everything. Jesus is completely a part of every decision that we make. If, if, I, if I seek his direction, then I'm showing that he is my master. He is my ruler. In fact, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. 
Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you the path to take. So we, we, we need to seek his direction in every area of our life. Well, this also means that I study the Bible to know Jesus personally and what the truth is. You know, we've got to have a clearly thought out philosophy for life. We, we've got to have a moral foundation of some kind. We've, we've got to have conviction that gives us stability and direction, especially when things get confusing. You see, when the world gets turned upside down, and frankly, we've been walking through a period like that for a year now, where the world feels like it's been turned upside down. When, when that happens, we've got to have a firm foundation that we can rely on, that we can have as solid footing under us so that we know what is true, so that we know what is right, even when the world is upside down. And we've got to have a foundation that, that cuts through all of the, the moral ambiguity and the confusion that's happening all around us. Fortunately for us, there is a book that has every principle we need for living. That book is the Bible. It's God's word to us. It's actually intended to be a manual for living for those who follow Jesus. And almost everything that the Bible tells us that is true, almost everything that is in line with God's ways and God's purposes, we need to understand that almost all of it goes completely against what is popular and what the world is telling us. God's principles just about always go against what conventional worldly wisdom is. And you, you can't just live your life doing what's popular because of what God says that his principles for living, uh, for money, for sex, for just about everything else out there, his principles are basically the opposite of what our culture is telling us. Now today, now more than ever, we need to settle in our mind what it's going to be our guiding principles. What, what is the truth? How do we know the truth? And how do we live our life by the truth? So we need to study the Bible and we need to get to know Jesus personally so that we can know what truth is. Next, this means I also saturate my life with godly teaching. Now, if you've attended Hope in person or as you're watching us online right now, uh, even just a couple of times, you're going to discover that we're not a perfect church. In, in, in fact, here's a secret for you. There are no perfect churches. But what I hope what, what you will find and what, what our goal is, is that each week when we do our messages and when we teach, it's not just about me or the other pastors sharing our opinions on the world or life or whatever it is we're talking about that day. But you're actually hearing not just our opinions, but you're hearing God's opinions. You're hearing God's words, how God thinks about the different things that we're talking about. See, they're not our opinions that we find in the Bible. They are God's opinions. So what does he think about what we should be doing as followers of Jesus? How do we live in a way that's in line with his ways? Because he tells us in his word that his ways are very different than ours. His ways are higher than ours. See, from the very moment that new spiritual life begins, remember that that chart that we looked at, when that new spiritual life, that new seed, when that begins, sitting under godly teaching is a very important part of spiritual growth. It, it helps us grow spiritually when we have godly teaching us, teaching us the truth. Now, the apostle Paul, he had a young man that he mentored. His name was Timothy. Timothy uh, learned under Paul's wisdom and his, his godly teaching and his insight. And Timothy eventually went on to pastor uh, to be a pastor and, and teach others godly wisdom and godly insight from God's word. And I want you to see an encouragement that Paul gives to Timothy. Listen to what he says. He says, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and they will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. You see, what, what Paul's telling Timothy here is, watch out, be careful, because a time is coming when people don't want to listen to the truth anymore. What they really want is they want to hear what they want to hear so that they can do what they want to do. They're going to be missing out on God's word. Now, look what, what is being said here 
uh, at Hope on, on Sunday mornings and what's being said in our, in our online messages is we're trying to help you saturate your life with godly truths. Now more than ever, we need to do that because there are so many voices bombarding us on a daily basis. We have friends telling us what we should do. We have the media telling us what we should do. We have our family members telling us what we should do. We have social media telling us what we should do. So we're getting bombarded by so many sources each and every day. And sometimes those sources that are bombarding us, what they're doing is they're telling our itching ears what we want to hear, not what we need to hear. And they, they point us down a path that's the, the wide, easy way that Jesus talked about. It, it's the way everybody else is going, and it's seducing us to believe that it is the way, but it's actually a way to destruction. We live in a, a day and age right now where many individuals and even churches and pastors, are, are they, they've broken loose from the truth, and they're telling people what they want to hear. It breaks my heart to say this, but there are churches out there, there, there are pastors who are saying things that are very popular right now in our culture. It's what people want to hear, but frankly, it's not truth. It's not truth according to God's word. In fact, it's, it's unbiblical. It's the opposite in many cases of what God's word says to us. And, and I understand that there is an incredible amount of pressure right now, pressure to say certain things, certain ways, and we don't want to offend anybody. But here's the truth. God's opinions are offensive. God's message is true. God doesn't think like we think. We don't think like God thinks. So it's the truth that we're talking about here, regardless of how offensive it might be. Now, hear this. The message of the gospel is a message of love. It's a message of forgiveness. It's a message of hope. It doesn't matter where you are right now. You can yield your life to Jesus. He can, will forgive you. You can become his follower. Jesus will forgive you. It doesn't matter what your life looks like or what you have done. That is the message of hope. That is the message of the gospel. But God is very clear in his word that there are certain boundaries, boundaries that those who claim to be followers of Jesus need to live within. And again, these aren't my opinions. These are God's opinions. It's what God tells us in his own word. And we can find some of those boundaries in 2 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. It says, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Anytime you hear that phrase, do not be deceived, pay attention because it's usually something we're easily deceived by. So do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor rivalers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. But listen to verse 11. And such were some of you but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Again, it doesn't matter what your life looks like right now if you're not a follower of Jesus. It doesn't matter what your life looks like before you bend the knee to Jesus. But when you bend the knee and you yield your life to Jesus and you call upon him to forgive you and you make him your Savior and you make him your Lord, then you're saying, Lord, you are my master, and I'm going to live within the boundaries that you have set up. Even if I don't like it, even if I don't understand it, I want to learn it and I want to do it because you are my master. In fact, here's the other thing. Real change in life, real change, change out of these lifestyles that was mentioned in the verse, that only occurs through the power of the Holy Spirit. We can't do it on our own. We're not good enough. We can try forever and we won't be good enough to change, but the Holy Spirit gives us the power to change. Another thing that it means is that I surround myself with Christ followers for godly advice. God made us for relationships. We've got to have others in our life. We need to be in community with others who are pursuing a walk with Jesus and trying to learn and grow on their own. And it's as we it relate in community as we encourage one another that we can help each other grow in our own walks with God. And there are times where we just need godly advice. And if you're in a community with others 
who are pursuing God and his ways, then you can get good godly advice. So saturating my life with godly teaching is good. But, but hear this, it's not enough. I, I, I say all the time, it's not enough to watch a message on Sunday online or even to be here in person. One hour a week is not enough. That's why we have groups here at Hope. That's why we have other opportunities for people to connect and encourage one another in community because godly teaching is good, but it's not enough. We've got to have other people in our lives who are encouraging us to follow and pursue Jesus. Finally, it means that I submit to Jesus as my Lord. In John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, I demonstrate my love and my loyalty to Jesus by obeying him. That's what it means to submit to Jesus as my Lord. In fact, Matthew 22, 37 through 40, Jesus replies, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And a second is equally important, love your neighbor as yourself. All the commandments and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commands. So we demonstrate our love and our loyalty by obeying Jesus. We're we're called to love him. Well, it's by our obedience that we demonstrate our love. John 14, 15 says, if you love me, obey my commands. John 14, 21 says, whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. You know, with other human beings, we can say that we love them, but then we can also show that we love them. With God, we don't just simply say, I love you, God. We say it, but we demonstrate it. We demonstrate our submission to him as our Lord, as we obey, as we do the things that he says to do, and then we don't do the things that he says not to do. So following Jesus, it costs me everything, but, but don't miss this. But I ultimately gain everything when I choose to make Jesus my Lord. Because again, Jesus, he says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We gain everything that we're looking for as we choose to follow Jesus. The Apostle Paul says to the church in Rome, in Romans 15, 13, he says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. You see, everything that we have been searching for in life, Everything that we have been looking for as we go out on our own way in rebellion against God, everything that we've been searching for, we ultimately find it in Jesus as we make him our Lord. Through Jesus, we can be forgiven and we can be reconciled to God, our creator. And and now in this life, we can be reconciled to him. But more importantly, we can be reconciled to him for eternity. So through Jesus, we gain everything. A little more specifically, we gain peace. We gain peace through Jesus. In fact, I want to paraphrase a a, a statement made by St. Augustine. He says, the Lord made us for him and our restless hearts only find rest in him. So as we make Jesus our Lord, we actually find peace. Through Jesus, we gain power. We gain the power to change our lives. Again, we cannot do this on our own. We just are simply not good enough to change on our own. We can change a few things, but the the real life change that's necessary, we get the power to do that through Jesus. Through Jesus, we gain gain protection. There's a certain amount of protection that we gain uh, as followers of Jesus. And then finally, through Jesus, we gain purpose. Whether or not we realize it or we can articulate it, each and every one of us is looking for meaning and we're looking for purpose. And we we look for it in all kinds of ways. We look for it in some of the most destructive ways. But nothing that we can find in this world will satisfy what we're looking for in purpose. It's only through Jesus that we can ultimately find purpose. God made us in his image. He made us for a relationship with him. But apart from Jesus, we will never truly discover our purpose. Here's a couple of verses on what the Bible says about purpose. 1 John 4, 7 through 9 says, Love comes from God, for God is love. 
God showed us how much he loved us by sending his son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. Proverbs 16, 4a says, the Lord has made everything for his own purposes. And Colossians 1, 16 says, everything, absolutely everything above and below, visible and invisible, everything got started in him and finds its purpose in him. And the him is Jesus. Jesus is the one who gives us purpose. And as we find our purpose, we also find direction and we find guidance from the Lord as we make Jesus our Lord. Psalm 32, 8 says, the Lord says, I will teach you and guide you in the way that you should live. I will watch over you and be your guide. And then John 14, 6, Jesus said to them again, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one finds their way to the Father except through me. You want direction? Jesus is the way. So Jesus is Lord of all. Following him costs me everything. But I ultimately gain everything as I make Jesus my Lord. So as we wrap up the series today and we wrap up this message, I want to ask you again that vitally important question, that number one most important question in the world, the question that Jesus asked his disciples nearly 2,000 years ago. And that question is, who do you say Jesus is? Who do you say Jesus is? As I think about my own answer to this question, a verse comes to my mind, and it's another statement made by Simon Peter. Simon Peter is one to be encouraged by because he said and did some things that weren't that great, and we can relate to it. But he said and did many things, and he got it right multiple times. And Jesus had been having a conversation with uh, his disciples, and, and, and in this term, the disciples, it's the larger group of people who were following him, not just the 12. And he'd been teaching them some really hard things. He, he was telling them some things that were very counterculture to what was going on in, in the world at that time, but they were the words of truth. Listen, listen to what Jesus says. After this, many of disciple, his disciples, again, that larger group beyond the 12, they turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed, and we have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Simon Peter's answer was, to whom shall we go? We know that you're the Holy One of God. So for me, and when I think about that question of who do I say Jesus is, Jesus is the Messiah. He's the anointed one from God. Jesus is my Savior. He's the one who died on the cross. And in my place, he died the death that I deserve to die because of my sin. But he did it in my place, and I can be forgiven, and I can have right standing with God, my Creator, and God, my Father. Jesus is my Lord. He's the one that has absolute control of my life to do as he wills with me and my life. Because of Jesus, I have meaning. I have purpose. I have hope. I know what love really is because of Jesus. Jesus died so that I could live. Jesus is my king. Do you know him? But here's the thing. Not only is following Jesus true, but more importantly, it just works. Jesus as Lord brings a much, much better life to however much time we have on this planet. And then when we leave this planet and we spend eternity with him, we will be in heaven and it will be perfect. So Jesus makes life so much better in the here and now, and then it will be perfect in eternity with him. So I want to invite you today. I want to invite you right now to say yes to Jesus. If you've never said yes to Jesus, I want to invite you to say yes. Say yes, he is the Messiah. Yes, he is my Savior. Yes, he is my Lord. Now maybe you're watching right now and you've already said yes to Jesus, but as you heard me talk about what it means 
to make Jesus your Lord, you realize that there's an area, or maybe more than one area, or maybe most of your life that you've been holding back. You haven't been letting him be Lord. He's Lord anyway, but you've been trying to hold on to it yourself. So I want to invite you to release what you've been trying to hold on to. Give it to him and recommit to make Jesus your Lord. Would you bow with me in prayer? Father, thank you for creating us and for loving us and for giving us a purpose. Thank you for not abandoning us, your creation, even when we are rebellious against you. Thank you for sending Jesus to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. If you're watching right now and you're ready to say yes to Jesus, you can simply pray along this silently in your heart with me. Say, dear Jesus, thank you for making me and loving me, even when I have ignored you and I have gone my own way. I know that I need you in my life, and I realize I have rebelled against you. I ask you to forgive me. Thank you for dying on the cross. Please help me to understand it more. But as much as I know right now, I want to follow you from now on. Please come into my life. Make me a new person on the inside. Thank you. I accept your gift of salvation. Father, thank you for fresh starts and for new beginnings. Thank you for the new life that has just begun for those who prayed along with me and put their faith and their trust in Jesus for the very first time. And thank you, Father, for those who have recommitted to follow Jesus and make him their Lord, Lord of all. Please show us what our next steps are. Give us the courage to take those steps. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our Messiah, our Lord, and our Savior. Amen.